The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24 Jacob. That's 844-24 Jacob. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinske. This is the show where we talk about everything happening in the world of pop culture. Great guest today. If you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you know Hodor, one of my favorite characters from the show. The man who played him, Christian Nairn, has a new book out telling the story of his amazing life, and we'll get into that. It's tricky, Sue, because, and I'll, we'll talk to Christian about this, his episode, which is called The Door, is definitely one of the five greatest episodes of Game of Thrones. Um, and you have not seen it yet. So we're going to talk around it so that it doesn't spoil it for you. Thank you. You know, when I was doing research for him, I saw that he died. And I was like, oh, no, which I, I hate that I know that. And I figured, okay, well, now I just don't want to know how. Right. And the how is really the, the most interesting and fascinating and moving part of it. So uh, I'll, I'll talk around that. I'll talk around okay. that uh, with, I uh, with Christian. He's got, he's got a really interesting life uh, and, a, and a great book. So, Sue Ballou, uh, there's a little bit of a, a, a shooting mat. No, I shouldn't say that. It's a little bit of a, uh, a debate between George Clooney and Quentin Tarantino, um, describe what's going on between these two legendary figures of film. Okay, so Tarantino did an interview with Baz Bam Boy, who writes okay. for Deadline, okay? Yep. And they were discussing um, movie stars and, and who, and, and asked, you know, who, can, who, can, who Tarantino considered movie stars. Okay, and he had mentioned Julia Roberts, Dio, you know Leonardo, Shalise Theron, and Denzel Washington, and Ben Ming Boy said, um, "What about George?" And he said, "Oh, he's not a movie star." And Tarantino, the boy was like, "What do you, what do you, what do you mean?" And he says, "What has he done, you know, in the last millennium or something like that?" So George was doing an interview for GQ with Brad Pitt and the conversation mm -hmm. came up and and he was like F him you know like you know what you know how how could he say that and he said that you know in in like the last millennium he says like that's been my career his whole career was in this millennium to well yes. I did his TV stuff before the millennium but it's been all his film stuff since then so my question is at some point are you just grandfathered in as a movie star? I mean, does it matter if maybe the, your last few films didn't do that great? Are you still a movie star? And I look at I look at someone like George Clooney as like a modern day Cary Grant. Yes. You know, he, you know, and you look at someone like Robert Redford. When was the last time Robert Redford did a film? But do you not consider Robert Redford a movie star? Of course. Of Would course. you not have considered Paul Newman a movie star? I yeah. Mean See, I think there are kind of two different questions here. And we talked about one a couple of weeks back about whether who can open a movie, um, which is different from are you a movie star? Now, I, I would argue not every movie star can open a movie the way Timothy Chalamet or The Rock or Glenn Powell can right now. But he's George Clooney. He is Hollywood royalty. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think Clooney is like an old-fashioned, classic movie star. So I think Tarantino is wrong here. Maybe Tarantino's talking about whether you can open a movie as opposed to whether you're a movie star. But I would say he's absolutely a movie star and one of a, one of our greatest movie stars, I think. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, he's a director, he's a producer. I mean, he's won Academy Awards 
on the other side of the camera. So, you know, he's he's the real deal. And he is always going to be a movie star to me. Yeah. I mean, he's a you're you're right. He's directed films. He's he's a filmmaker. Uh, what is that movie he did? Good Night and Good Luck, which was such a good movie that he directed with David Siriana. Siriana. Uh, did he direct Siriana? No, he won the Oscar for Siriana. He won the Oscar for that. Yeah, yeah, that was what he won for uh, Best Supporting Actor. But yeah, he's a movie star. I don't know what Quentin Tarantino's talking about. I am Team Clooney, as if he needs any support. He's George Clooney. <laughs> so, uh, Subalu, I found something before we get to Christian. Um, this is from BuzzFeed, which is, by the way, written all by AI now. There really? are no writers at BuzzFeed. They've got AI that goes around the internet and scrapes stuff up and says and and repackages it and and makes it into a story. Shame on them. And yet, I'm going to do one of their stories. <laughs> so, so they're AI people uh, or AI machines, computers, the people that work for them, the things that work for them. Uh, went around and found really hot pop culture takes. So. I thought I would read you, and they're hot. I thought I would read you these takes and get your reaction to them. I'll give mine too. Um, so number one is, you know what minions are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this, this is number one. I hate minions. I think they're stupid and would pay money to hunt one for sport. Now, I will say I have never seen a Despicable Me movie. I know they're like these yellow things that wear glasses and they run around. They're kind of like thumbs. Uh, I, maybe if I watched them, they would be more annoying, but I just think they're for little kids. Uh, the idea of hunting one for sport though, is actually sounds kind of fun. Sounds very fantasy Island, doesn't it? Very fantasy Island. And it sounds like maybe a new video game. Yeah. Oh yeah. Another one. Yeah. Hunt the minions. <laughs> um, all right. Here's number two. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen a Despicable Me movie? Never. No. Yeah. Me either. Me either. I, they're gigantic. So good. Good for them. All right, number two, live action adaptations of pretty much anything can get on my nerves. Most of the Disney remakes are just cash grabs rehashing the same story for nostalgia points. How do you feel about Disney live action remakes? You know, I am not a huge Disney fan, so I I don't I don't really care, to be honest with you. I think they're I I I agree with this take. Um Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. I don't need to see the live action versions of the same thing I saw animated. So I, I actually agree. I think it is a total cash grab. Well, and they're also, you know, they make them into Broadway shows. It's like enough already. Yeah. Enough Listen, already with I know, Disney. So- I'm like some old Jew You're right. in Florida. The, in Florida. The, little, the Little Mermaid is an animated film. It's a Broadway show and it's a live action film. It's a coloring book. I mean, no, the coloring <laughs> book. And, and, you know, it's for kids. It's you know? a plush animal. It's all that stuff. Yes. All right. Here's one. The movie Joker. I love Joaquin Phoenix, but this movie was nothing but taxi driver with face paint. Okay. Interesting. You know what? That, you know, He's from the trailer. absolutely right. <laughs> it looks like that from the trailer. Now, did you see the first Joker? I did. Oh, God. It is yeah, so good, but it is. I mean, he is Travis Bickle. Yeah. This but is, I, but I, I, yeah, I mean, this, are you looking at me? This is basically the the taxi driver story with Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker, right. which I think is fine. It's a great universe. I, you know, I, I always thought there are like 10 movies and they keep getting remade over and over again, like same general story, same general plot. And this is just one of those. The taxi driver model, I think, absolutely works here for Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix. Um, okay, here is one. Oh, that one doesn't matter. Uh, that one doesn't matter. Uh, okay, La La Land was a beautiful but not very good movie. No, oh, I don't agree there. I like. I don't it. either. I loved La La Land. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw somebody say that the opening ceremonies for the Olympics, uh, they should have Damien Chazelle do them. And have that sort of vibe from the opening scene of uh, of La La Land where they're stuck on the freeway. Oh, that's uh, funny. Yeah, it'd be good. It'd be good. 
Uh, all right, I don't understand the hype about Devil Wears Prada. Such a boring movie. Okay, you know what? If I'm lost at I don't understand. You know why? Because it's AI. That's why you don't understand. <laughs> and, the, and, and going back to La La Land, it's the same thing. You okay, know? but wait, wait. Just to just to be clear, these are real people's takes. Buzz, the AI is just going around and finding them off the internet. So oh, all this okay. stuff was written by a person, but oh, then okay. compiled and aggregated by BuzzFeed. By, so these are oh. real takes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I couldn't disagree more on Devil Wars Prada. I think when all is said and done, it's going to go down as one of Meryl Streep's five best performances. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're making the sequel. Did you see that? No, I did not. Yeah, they're making a sequel, her and Emily Blunt. And if I remember the plot right, uh, she's still at the fancy magazine, but magazines are going away, right? Magazines are disappearing. So all of a sudden, Miranda, which is the Meryl Streep character, has less influence, less sway in the world. And Emily Blunt somehow is online and getting more attention. So there's a rivalry between those two. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. I love the uh, scene in Devil Wears Prada, and I use this line all the time where Emily Blunt is trying to lose weight so she can fit into her dress at a big fancy gala. And she says, I'm just one stomach flu away from my goal weight. <laughs> and I'm like, That's a that great is, line. It is such a good line. Such great a good line. line. Okay, let's do, uh, let's do one more here. Oh, this is actually an interesting subject. I hate binge watching culture. I honestly don't think that people appreciate TV shows the same way they used to because of this, as everyone is consuming it so quickly and then jumping straight into the next thing. If you haven't watched an entire season within 12 hours of it dropping, then spoilers are everywhere and it's your own fault for seeing them because you use the internet. I kind of agree with this. I know it's very harsh. <laughs> it's like, like you know, reprimanding people from going, you know, from people who are pissed off about it because they go on the internet. But, but you know, that but that to me is. A little do you harsh. like the binging? Do you do you like binging? You know, I, I a lot of times I do because it's become part of the way we watch shows these days. So when a show is when an episode is over, the initial response that I, I, I usually from Tom, my husband, he'll be like, is there another one? Right. Is there right. another one? Right. And, and um, so I, I, I understand the gripe about it. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm kind of guilty of it. I, okay. I, I like, I like to be able to, the only show that, and we talked about this, that I was okay with not being able to binge was House of the Dragon because it was so dense that yeah. it was like, you know, although I'm binging Game of Thrones right now. Now, so. let me give you two shows and you tell me which was a better viewing experience. Both excellent, excellent shows. Um, the Bear, which dropped all its episodes at once, or Hacks, which on HBO Max, you waited for each week for the next episode. Which was the better viewing experience for you? Hacks. Me too. Now, don't you think part of it was that it you waited for it and Sunday night, here it came, and you didn't like watch and, and not necessarily be able to appreciate uh, the episodes because you watched so many in a row. So I just think House of the Dragon... Hacks, um, True Detective, Night Country, all those ones worked for me in part because they were once a week. Now, is that is was it done because it's more of a money-making situation? Because then you know that people are going to, I mean, are people not going to watch it as much as they would watch it if they were getting it week by week? Like, what was the reason to do the binging to begin with? Yeah, see, I don't know. Like, so he makes a good, or he or she makes an interesting point. So uh, the bear dropped in all this season, the entire season dropped, all of season three, right? Season three? I think, I think that's so. right. Yeah. And 
Um, then you would start watching it and like people at work would say, didn't you see the one where this thing happened with the cooking in the kitchen? And the, <laughs> that's kind of a description, the cooking in the kitchen. Um, and I'd be like, no, I didn't see that one. Don't tell me about that one. That's episode, that was episode seven and I'm on episode three. So all of a sudden you don't have the, the buzziness, the mm -hmm. let's talk about it. Did you see what happened last night? Can't wait to next week. I think sometimes when people do that, they can't, it doesn't generate the buzz that it would if it was a week by week show. Right. And when someone says, are you watching the bear? And you say, yes, they don't ask you a lot of times, what episode are you up to? Right. And then right. they will just go and ruin it for you. Exactly. Exactly. So I think this one has, has merit, this particular yeah, I do. take. I, 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 I do too. I do too. Last one. And this is controversial. Hamilton is just fine. It's a decent musical, but the first act doesn't end where it should, and the second act is so goddamn boring. There are some good songs, but it isn't God's gift to musical theater like people make it out to be. In my opinion, it would have been much more interesting if it were told through the eyes of Eliza and Angelica. Uh, Hamilton as a musical is just fine. See, I don't agree with that because I, I really either. loved Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I it was like a a great musical history lesson for me because there was so Absolutely. much there that I did not know. Absolutely. Yeah. There yeah. was more, it was more than just going to see a Broadway show. Now I would argue that it's not Lin-Manuel Miranda's best musical because I liked In the Heights more than I liked Hamilton, but mm -hmm. to say Hamilton, which I think won the Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> it's just fine is uh, is really harsh and I completely disagree with. So there are your BuzzFeed hot takes. What did you think of what AI found on the internet for us to talk about? I thought they found great stuff. Well, keep it up, BuzzFeed. Keep it up, computers. <laughs> keep, keep going out there. All right, here we go. Our guest today played the beloved Hodor on Game of Thrones. Then Since then, he has acted on shows like Our Flag Means Death, worked as Ireland's most prolific house DJ, and even performed as a drag queen called Revlon. Now he has a new memoir out. It's called Beyond the Throne. Christian Nairn joins us. Christian, thank you very much for coming on, man. We appreciate it a lot. Congratulations on the book and, <laughs> and uh, you know, all that stuff. A amazing stuff. Thank you so much. It still feels uh, very surreal to me, but um, thank you for having me, first of all, too. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe it's happening still. <laughs> So I kind of want to start, let's start with the book. You've lived a fascinating life yeah. to get into some of it. Uh, your personal journey is amazing and interesting and compelling. Uh, and what made now the right time for you to write a memoir? Well, over the years of touring and um, just various other work commitments all over the world, uh, my manager and I, we always talked about, you know, you, you get downtime together. And uh, I always told them stories about, my growing up in Belfast and my DJing career. And he turned to me one day and just said, you've got to write this down. You've got to write this stuff down. I mean, there are people who could maybe, maybe benefit from this in some way. Um, and it's fairly inspirational, apparently. And it's, it's weird to me to say that about my own story, you realize. But um, <laughs> and, I will uh, say it. It's inspirational. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was very, he was very much behind me doing it. And, um, despite my initial reticence, it was a, it was a very cleansing process, and I really enjoyed doing it. I'm very proud of the of the end product. I have to tell you, I picked up the book yesterday. We got um, we had gotten uh, a, an, an an advanced copy in a PDF, and it's so difficult for me to read on it the is. computer. So, the, but the book Same. came yes, the book came yesterday, and I I almost finished it. I Under could way. not put this book down. Show I just them all your bookmarks and stuff. I'll just show you. Oh all my gosh. Work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. I felt like, you know, I'm studying for a test. Like a class uh, in Christianaire. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm but what, so, I, wow. <laughs> what, what I love so much, because I write, and what I love about your writing is that it's so vivid, and it's funny, and it's poignant, and... 
your oh. uh, your analogies. Um, there was one analogy that you made about your mom falling in this like hole or like a little like a little hole in the ground, and you were talking about her on her back out. She was flailing like a yeah. like a like a beetle, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, I, I, I just about a turtle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just I I, I just you know I. I, I didn't really know a hell of a lot about you before seeing, um, okay. you know, I, I, can't, I came to Game of Thrones late, so I haven't even okay. finished. I haven't finished it yet. So, um, uh, yeah, so, by the way, Christian, we've got to be careful here because she's not seen oh, the on. big episode. She's not seen the door. So, what? so okay, we'll talk so, around it. I know. I said to, and, and I was so, I was uh -huh. so upset because in researching you, I stumbled upon the fact that you died in the show, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm yeah. only in the second season." And I was like, "Oh my god, okay." Oh wow! So, so I know, so I know you you died, but I don't know how you died, and I don't know, okay. I don't want to know. But Steve said he'll talk around uh, it. So. Yeah, we, we we can try to talk around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, so that, that's a big thing to avoid, but I'm sure we can do it successfully. <laughs> so, um, so let me let me ask oh. you about um how how you got on the show you write about this in the book but de de yeah. describe the audition process and how how you got got uh, connected with game of thrones um i was working as a performer on a, a dj on the local scene in belfast and um i would have occasionally done maybe some reality tv stuff I, I did a little bit of reality tv uh in the past and I studied acting uh, at the same time as studied music, but I always preferred music. Um, so that's why I really pushed forward. Um, I, I always, people were always saying to me, God, you should be on screen. You should be on TV. I never listened to them. Uh, I, obviously, you don't listen to that kind of thing. Uh, but there was a guy who was kind of acting like an agent for me. And he put me forward for an audition for Hot Fuzz, which I'm sure you've heard of the Simon Pegg yeah, movie. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and I didn't get the part. Um, I literally fell off an airplane at 6 a.m. in the morning after being drunk the night before. Uh, this is my life back then, um, as you probably read. Um, uh, fell into the audition. All I knew was the character had one word. I mean, and wasn't given any other information. <laughs> I thought that was enough. Uh, I was the, I'd never worked <laughs> as a professional actor back then. I didn't have any backstory. I didn't have any grasp of what I was going to do. I basically stumbled around with a hangover saying yarp it wasn't the word i believe um so i didn't get the part funny enough uh i wouldn't have given it to me either uh but then five years later i, I was literally in the middle of a normal day uh, uh however normal my life ever is uh and yeah i got a call saying there's a new show in town basically um and we need you to come for an audition uh the lady gold who was the casting director she asked for you personally and I was like, is that that lady, that lovely lady who I had a hangover in front of? Um, <laughs> why is she possibly calling me back? Why? I mean, I don't know. But I went and did it. I, I was very, as as you'll see in the book, I was very hesitant to do it because of various reasons, um, even to do with the tropes and, and the expectations on people of my size and my own expectations of myself, you know, and, that, and, and going to play like a big, and obviously Hodor didn't really turn out to be dumb. But that's how it was kind of painted to me at the start. So it wasn't really that attractive. Um, then once I started to learn about the character, once I started to learn about the show, um, through my stinted mother of, of all things, um, it just happened. Just like everything in my crazy, chaotic, uh, downhill race of a life is. Um, I didn't plan it. And it just happened. And I went with it. <laughs> Mm. Uh, that's, I always try to go. With, I always try to go with things. I don't like the I'm a say yes man, uh, but I, I'm not. Okay, I do say no. Yeah, but I, I try with career things. I try to. I try to push myself out of a bubble. So, so I you... love Hodor, one of my favorite characters in Game of Thrones. And for me, Thank the you. reason I love Hodor is because he embodies loyalty and self sacrifice. Do you think that's uh -huh. why he's so beloved, those two qualities? Yeah. Um, I think especially when you look at him and the landscape of all the characters around him. Um, with, I did have a conversation. Someone brought up the Grey Worm as another, until the end, when he kind of lost. Oh, not, that's uh, all right. That's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> not me. I don't care. <laughs> anyway, you he's do, another you, nice you, character. You, 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 
You do the interview you, you want to do. Yet. If if it if it you comes out, it comes yet. out. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I, I've met him. I've met been... him. Oh yeah, I was okay. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Graham's quite a nice character as well um, at, at this stage, we'll say. Um, and I think that it made him stand out in that way. And also, he's a kind of character which I'm going to kind of compare. This is a really weird. Are you ready for this, guys? This is a weird. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, looking at Bella from Twilight, right? Yes. Kind of, kind of a, a character which you can pour yourself into and you can see yourself in the situation. You know, I, I think that with character, with characters like Hodor, you can kind of do the same. You can kind of put yourself in his shoes. You can sort of understand how he's feeling, um, being a put down, being a bit put upon, and having quite a hard life. I, I think people kind of identify to that. So Not you be came wrong. Up, yeah, no, no. So you, you, I was reading in the book. You came up with a backstory for yourself um, of why he is the way he is. T- tell us about how uh-huh. you came came to that. Hmm. Well, do you know what was hard about it? It was because a lot of fans at the time, wonderful fans, were coming to me with like, "This is what I think. <laughs> this is what I think." So a lot of my stories got kind of woven in with like a fan fiction, and there's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot more fan fiction for the most recent show I've been on. But we'll probably come back to that at some stage. But the fan fiction for Game of Thrones was just crazy and incredible. And there was one that they, they suspected that Hodor was one of the lost Clegane brothers, um, like Sandor, Gregor, and Hodor. And I kind of liked that one. I kind of, uh, but my one was um, obviously I had the tattoos on my face, and they were going to have to cover those because I don't think um, there were too many tattoo parlors in Westeros yes. not at that time. And, and uh, yeah, they were going to build a scar on top of the tattoo. And I thought, well, how could Hodor possibly have lost his ability to to communicate? Uh, maybe he was shooting a horse and it kicked him in the head on the temple. It left like a scar here. Yeah. And um, that kind of tied up that for me. And it just gave me a bit of authenticity to it. So that's what I had in my mind. Completely wrong, but that's okay. So what what is the challenge uh, for an actor to not have dialogue? I mean, just to say, Hodor, I mean, what, what, how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, I didn't really realize how intelligent it, it would be when I took on the parts. Um, and that's a good thing because it really taught me how to act in a way. Um, but uh, challenges... Uh, well, one of the challenges, honestly, would be—I haven't really said this before—but when you're on, on stage or on set with such a with such a formidable and experienced cast, uh, and I don't have these big sort of one-liners and uh, sort of not to compete, but sort of feel like you're on a level with them. Uh, it feels a bit strange only having that one word at first to express yourself, and but then I, I sort of saw it as a challenge that it was because there's no there were no excuses in Game of Thrones. You have to sort of be good. Or else you wouldn't be there. Um, so I sort of found a way to challenge myself with it and bring myself up to a similar level to body language and sort of being really like being aware of where I was placed in a scene and every single thing from the shadows to how I held my hands, everything I thought about, everything was considered. But then when I really got into the character, it kind of came naturally. Um, mm. and, there, and there's a huge difference between me and Hodor. Um, He's way nicer than I am. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of nicer than everybody. So yeah, not Hodor. Insult. Hodor was kind yeah. of a saint. Mm. Yeah, and I'm certainly not that. But uh, there are there are parallels there, which I definitely called on. Um, I had hearing issues. I still do. Um, not anything to be worried about or anything. But I had hearing issues, particularly when I was a child. I would have done a lot of lip reading, and I studied to be a sign language interpreter, and that really helped me with the body language and how to sort of project time feeling without words. Yeah. So I knew from a really young age that I was different. I knew I was gay. I, I loved to perform all that stuff. I wasn't like the other kids in, in a lot of ways. When did you know you were different that you really had to chart your own course? This is back as far as my memory goes, honestly. Um, and it wasn't any realization that I had. It's like the world will tell you. Um, and the world certainly told me. Um, yeah, I, I basically, I would say by the time I was 
14, 15, I'd probably pretty much become a bit of a hermit because I couldn't go out of the house without people commenting. Um, it's really changed now. I don't mean because of Hodor, but I think society is like, obviously it's expanded. And like, I remember walking into Belfast on a Saturday afternoon with pillar box red hair. And it was like, like there was a second coming or like aliens have landed, you know, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. Um, people are all shapes, sizes and colors and that's more obvious now. But, um, back in the day, it was rough, man. Uh, it was like, you, you, when you're, when you're grappling with your own self image and that's bad enough and you're, it's constantly being reassured, constantly being compounded by, because, and then your parents and your teachers will come to you and try and comfort you. Uh, it don't, it's, not, it's not really real stuff, but you can say it is real because uh, only when you're older, do you understand like how to cope with that? But as a child. Yeah, you don't. Have, you can't really listen to the people who are trying to protect you because it's really there, really there. Um, and, until you find your courage, um, and are you confident in who you are? I'm on such a tangent. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but, um, no, we love that. Yeah, this is uh, why we do podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's pretty much that. Uh, all, all of that came into my portrayal in Portor. My shyness when I was a child, I called back to that. Uh, I called back to just being made to feel ashamed. You know, um, I don't think Hodor really felt that, but I used that as part of him. So, yeah, I could definitely called stuff back. You, you, there's a a, a part in the book um, that where you really took ownership of 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 who you you are and and were at that time when you were younger. You had a friend named Nick, who. Uh, or lack of a better way of saying it, he was a homophobe and he would say things about yeah. gays and and uh, and not knowing that uh, where you were in your life. And um, yeah. after a while, I obviously it, it got to you and got to you and 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 you told him who you were. Yeah. And expecting him to maybe you know not be your friend anymore, will kind of walk yeah. away from that from was... your relationship. And he did yeah. the polar opposite. And embraced it, and then joined exactly. you, and went to clubs uh -huh. with you, and I, I, it was so beautiful to me. So talk about that and how that made you feel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't just say that Nicky was a homophobe. I was a I was a closeted homophobe as well. I mean, I was just going along with it. You know, right. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what else to say. I'm sure you've all, as, a, as gay people have through a lot of experience stuff. Uh, until you until you really come out, you kind of have to go along with it a bit, and it's really damaging. But um. Yeah, I, I, we were the usual tirades of abuse. And I think we had a show here called Supermarket Sweep. And there was a guy, God rest his soul, Dale Winton. And he's dead now, but um, he was extremely camp and extremely tanned. And he'd be like, oh, did you see him on TV last night? Oh, it's a disgrace. And I'd be like, oh, disgusting, disgusting. And I'm like, actually, you know what I mean? I, I can't do this anymore. Um, and yeah, he became my most steadfast friend. And you know what I mean of, of everyone. And to this day, I don't regret selling him first. I don't, he was the first person I told. Um, and I do not regret it to this day. Um, he was the perfect person to tell. But on the, the cover of it, he would have been the worst person to tell because I didn't plan to do it. It was an explosion of like I can't do this anymore. You know, I kind of got so, to the stage where I didn't really care anymore either. I mean, it took me a long time to get there, but when you realize it. It's not really that important and on the, on the other side of the coin if it's that important for somebody else really are they your friend right yeah right you know yep so you grew up in northern ireland you're in northern ireland right now uh during the yep. troubles um and it was you and your mom I, i'm wondering what it was like growing up in a place where there is kind of this low level war going on and how did that impact you as a kid well, there were definitely times when the world was low level. Um, uh, I would call what it is now low level um, because there's still like a veiled threat there. Although we're very happily living in peacetime at the moment, I'm telling you, very, very happily living in peacetime. And I don't want that ever to change, ever to change. But um, yeah, it was it was just different, man. I don't want to overplay it. I don't want to underplay it because we all got on with our lives. Like, I don't want people to think we were like um, in a nuclear winter or um, and we were sheltering. But it's the same, I believe. Forgive me if I'm speaking ignorantly here, but like in Ukraine, 
Um, I believe people are trying to get on with their lives in the middle of all that craziness, um, which is very admirable. Um, in fact, I know it's true. I have friends who live there, and I know what's happening. So they're, they're trying to have their jobs. They're trying to do social things. They're trying to have a comic con. They're just trying to get back to normal in a way that they can in the middle of all this freaking chaos. That's kind of what it was like in Belfast. It was like, we're all going to carry on regardless of all this absolutely insanely horrible stuff that's happening around us. Um, and in a way, I think that's why Irish people are the way we are. Um, I think we cope with our, our grief and cope with our our stresses in a very sort of sarcastic and comedic way. But I think that's the only way we can. I think that's the only way we can do it. Because um, our senses of humor, sometimes having traveled the world, talk people, uh, we're, we're very self-deprecating and very deprecating to our friends and stuff. It's a, side, it's a total side of affection, but people don't get it. It's because of the troubles. It's just how we, we, we cope with it. We make jokes about it and the most black humor. Um, yes. But that's, that's all we could do. Um, but getting on with it, it was incredible having it all lifted um, after the peace process. Um, you realized how, how clamped down you were. Um, yeah. And like all the security or all the security checkpoints. Like my entire memories of going into malls and um, shopping centers was like my mom having her bag emptied out, like the search for explosives. We had to check yeah. her cars, that kind of stuff. It was absolutely crazy. And when I went to college, um, I'm sure anybody else will remember this in Belfast. Like I went to the College of Business Studies, and like probably once a month, maybe once every couple of months, um, that would be rocked by bomb blasts, and you'd be like evacuated to get out and stuff. But I don't feel that in any way traumatized, but it definitely is a part of who I am in a very strong way. Um, but I, I don't feel it's like negatively impacting me. Maybe others will say differently, <laughs> but uh, you know. It's a, it's a complicated one. Yeah. I mean, does it bring back memories? I mean, being in a show where there is war is it's imminent. It's happening. I mean, it's it's, you know, bloodshed all around. Um, d- does that conjure up feelings for you um, from your past? It would, it would have. I think it would have. But luckily, we were constantly on the run. Um, uh, we, uh, after season two, we pretty much disappear off into the wilds. Um, so we were kind of kept away from the war. We had our own battle to fight. We were doing the sort of mystical, magical sort of journey. Uh, well, but yeah, I, I think it would have been um, that sort of sense of threat and, and, and looming. But it was, it was never that type of war here, though. It, it was more uh, subversive. Um, it was kind of dirtier in a way. It was, you know, it's just terrorism. It is what it is. It's called what it is. Um, and on both sides, by the way, I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not a fan of violence in any form. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you are one of Ireland's biggest house DJs. Um, I'm curious, yeah. when when did you start? How long does it take to get good? How long does it take to get great? Or were you just a natural? So, you're assuming I'm good? <laughs> I, I'm assuming. Oh, I mean, I've seen the, the, the places you've, you've, uh, you've DJed, and I mean, they're very impressive. You seen Paris Hilton though? She's no, I'm not a joke. I love <laughs> Paris Hilton. I'm like kidding. Um, yeah, I uh, I was working in the Kremlin, which is a very infamous gay venue here in Belfast. I was working as a drag artist, actually, believe it or not, um, and that sort of morphed into being a DJ through me filling in for people. Uh, while I was at college, learning my acting craft and learning uh, about music production, I learned how to DJ the technicality of it, just how to use the decks and the equipment. Um, so that was already in there. Um, I'd always been like a prolific music collection. Um, that guy, Nicky and I, um, the one who I came out to, he and I, every Monday morning, we would go down to our local record shop, armed with like our pocket money, like 15 pounds or whatever. And we would buy like all the 99p or cents CD singles, CD, CD singles of, of everything. It didn't matter what it was, just to have it. And so I had this massive music collection built in for a guy. Um, it's better than, um, sorry. But it was, <laughs> and <laughs> after that, I never stopped DJing. And that was it um, for 20, 27 years now, uh, 23 years. My mouth is bad. Um, so say 23 years and <laughs> you never stop improving. You never stop improving. Um, every time you think you're, you've reached the pinnacle or you're going to get, I don't mean pinnacle of like greatest, by the way. I mean, just where you're at. Um, you think you've got the, the technique down. There's something else you'll learn. And I love that. 
or else you'll see another DJ. Most of my DJ techniques are learned from people I've DJed with just by watching. Um, so I know people do that to me too. That's a wonder, a wonderful way to learn. It's almost like an old, like tribal sort of way to learn. You know, I love that. I think that's, rather than going to a DJ class, I would encourage you to go to a club. Actually, I know that's an alien concept in today's world, but go to a club. Maybe have a, a small glass of non-alcoholic baby sham. Take a few <laughs> selfies and go watch this friggin' DJ, and he'll teach you how to DJ just by watching. So you were you were doing it. Um, were you do were you DJing the whole time you were on the show? Because I'm, yes. I'm only on. on okay, okay. Because I I haven't finished the book, so I know that throughout the book you talked about how you went back after um, mm-hmm. season, especially after season one, because I'm only in season two. Um, and uh, <laughs> and would so you, you still are doing it. Do you know what? I would love to be in your shoes. I would love not to know what's going to happen. I would love. Yeah. To be by like the way, me too. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm kind of en- I'm kind of envious, right? She gets to experience <laughs> it for the first time, and it's such an mm-hmm. amazing, legendary show. It gets really wild. I'm just going to say that it's wild. So, um, so could you repeat the question for me? Um, no, I was just asking you if you if you still yeah. DJ now. Um, yeah, I don't think as much as I used to um, post COVID, but they were pre-COVID, and nothing really has, for me at least. I know it's different for everybody, um, but it hasn't really come back for me. I I I, I am ready to start doing festivals. Um, I have a few coming up this summer, and then that should be me back on the road. I've got a lot of new music and stuff coming out, but I just felt like COVID kind of caused a bit of a door jam, um, especially in the club scene. I very much would still be on the club scene, big clubs, a couple of thousand people, that sort of thing. They're kind of hard to find now, because um, mm. I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're in that demographic or you go out in that, or if you're big partiers or whatever. But the club scene now is unrecognizable. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, big at the clubs. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Sue's I'm, also I'm a, big I'm at the a, clubs. I'm a, I'm a big clubber. Yeah. Bottle service, <laughs> and yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Neither of us have been in a club <laughs> in years. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I still feel like I want to though, and I, I, I don't, I miss it. I, I miss the whole social interaction of it all. I miss even smell of cigarettes smoking. It's not weird. I hate cigarettes. I hate, yeah. it. I hate people smoking around me. But I actually miss like coming home on Sunday morning and going, Ugh. you know, I smell yeah, like right. marble light. <laughs> I, I have an odd question for you. Speaking of smells, you know, when I uh-huh. watch like period piece, uh, films or shows, um. Here you are. It's musty. It's muddy. There's <laughs> pigs. I mean, you know, you you're in a time where people weren't wearing deodorant or perfume or cologne. What what does it smell like on set? Hmm. Exactly what you imagine. Exactly what you imagine, especially in my trailer. I might add. Um, wow. Uh, like there, there's live animals there. There's dead animals there. There's there's butchery. There is the shite on the floor. There's horse manure, horse pests, everything on the floor. It does smell. Uh, I'm here to tell you now that my costume wasn't really washed for uh, seven years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was that was yeah. some that was some flavorful. Uh, I would come in with like a cheapest a flavorful. Bottle after <laughs> yeah, but I came in with a like a cheap bottle of like CKB or CK one. Uh, and I just would cover it in like the most horrible, gaudy aftershave. But then I realized that I just smelled like a pig with aftershave on. So <laughs> it didn't really work. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and people are saying, and that's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering if, if actors are banned uh, from, you know, wearing deodorant or um, just to no. get. No, you, they, no. you, you have, you have no, to, no, you no. have to. Yeah, we okay. have human rights. You know, we have great human rights. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so tell me about Redline. This ah. is your uh, your drag oh, queen wow. persona. Yeah. Where did it come from? What's the inspiration? All all that stuff. Well, I, I, I would say she's dormant at the moment, or I, I'm not. Even gonna, I'm not going to say she is an it. She's very much an it. Uh, always has been an it, and always will be an it. Uh, she's more of a monster than a female impersonation. Um, but it really rose from the shy part of my personality and the shy person who was always getting commented on for being too tall, looking a certain way, being overweight, whatever. Um, it kind of rose like Godzilla 
from that, um, almost literally. Um, and it was a two fingers up. Honestly, I, I didn't realize at the time, but it was a two fingers up to my old way of being. And it was going to be like, this is who I am. In fact, I'm going to cover it in spikes and you can fuck off if you don't like it. Um, that was kind of, that's kind of what happened. And that's, it's really stuck. It's really stuck with me. Um, not just the spikes, because they can be sticky. Um, um, but anyway, stick them, of course. Uh, it's just gone downhill horribly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just that fuck you. And I can drag hand dress. I guess I remember saying to my friends, I'm going to do drag. And what's the order the exception of Lee, really? Uh, we mentioned in the book, uh, they were like, you can't do that. You're seven foot tall. You won't look like a woman. And that, that's not the point. Not the point. Not the point, guys. But yeah, I, I, I used Revlon as a shield. I used her as like a barrier for me to, uh, like a chrysalis, almost. I don't know if I'm twee, but it really was. I sort of spent like four or five years intensively doing Revlon. And then I realized at the end I didn't need to do it anymore. Because I was okay doing it as me. I was confident enough to go on stage. I couldn't even do a debate in school. So, so was even, it was it kind of a mask yeah. for you, Christian? Was it sort of a mask? Yeah. Literally, that uh, you put on your makeup, you put on your wig. Uh, it's almost like a superhero costume in a way. I don't <laughs> want to say superhero because it is just drag at the end of the day. But um, that's the kind of how it feels. You know, you're putting on your little Superman crest, and all of a sudden the things that come fat at you, you're a little bit more resilient, and you're a little bit more able to fire it back. Or whatever, whatever is healthiest for you. So yeah. I want to ask you one last know. question, um, and I want to circle back to Game of Thrones, one of the greatest shows of all time, and one of the top five episodes in the whole series is the door, uh, where the story sort of comes together for Hodor. It is so emotional. I hadn't read the book, so I didn't know the meaning of Hodor until we got there. Sue still doesn't know the meaning of Hodor. Um, but you're a, an incredible part of television history. What what does that what does that feel like? <laughs> it's hard to even hear that, but um Yeah. I mean, I've watched the show a few times myself and I just it still gives me a bit of a gravitas to it. And I just I think it changed TV. I do. Uh, I really do think it changed TV. I'm just proud of it. I love it. And as a fantasy nerd. It's just, it's so fitting for me to be part of this thing. And I still feel lucky. I still feel, I still feel lucky. I turned the car around that day. I still feel lucky. I went to that silly, weird audition, which is on the internet, sadly. Uh, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I humiliated myself in that way because it paid off a million times over. I, I, I feel so grateful for, for that moment. Uh, well, listen, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Sue. Well Sorry. No, I was going to say that it's capped off by the fact that you had plans to go out to lunch with a friend and you didn't want to cancel. You <laughs> didn't want to cancel your lunch. Well, no. Is, is uh, that more importantly, I, I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I was hungry. It's important. It's important to be nourished, you know. <laughs> okay. He wasn't that yeah. great of a friend. <laughs> uh, no, we're still friends. I actually saw him last night, and he, he loves that. He loves that story. He knows. Uh, he knows how close it was. The uh, yeah. chicken burger almost won. It almost won out. Oh, that's and great. Know, we but, well, it's great. He's part of your story. He's part of you doing exactly. this iconic role. So, how sweet is that? So, I know. I love that. I love that fact. Yeah. Well, <laughs> listen. The uh, the book is called Beyond the Throne. Uh, it is a terrific memoir, and if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you absolutely got to check it out. Fascinating life, amazing life, unbelievable roller coaster uh, a journey. And and Christian, thanks a lot for coming on and sharing part of it with us. I really appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. There you have it, Christian Nairn. Did we give anything away, Sue? Do you have any sense for what is going to happen on Game of Thrones? No, and I thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was the least I could do. <laughs> yes, I appreciate uh, now, that. Now, when do, what is your estimated time of completion, your ETC on uh, Game of Thrones? Well, I'm in the, I'm up to the third episode of the second season, so oh, I know you got a ways. I know, so it's season six, right? I think it's, it's season uh, six. Six years, yes, six seasons. Okay, 
So, uh, you know, we're trying to plow through, but, you know, other things get in the way. Other things yeah, to no, watch. Yeah, no, I totally get it. And there's so there's so much stuff to watch right now. Right. Uh, there's so much stuff out there. Um, so um, I want to remind everybody that uh, you can subscribe to the Culture Pop Podcast YouTube channel. Please do that. Uh, hit the like button and then leave us some kind of comment, review, question, whatever you've got. Uh, also, we're on Apple and Spotify and all the platforms. Subscribe to the Culture Pop Podcast channel, uh, the show, and you'll know when a new one comes out. Leave us a five-star rating and review. We love it when you do that. Sue, it is great seeing you. Thank you very much, and we will see everybody next time on the Culture Pop Podcast.